So uh, as Erica mentioned, I propose the topic tonight of why this crisis is different or may be different. And that, that's going to be the point is how to think about where we might end up at the end of all this mess that we're currently in. Um, I want to try and put the whole business right now in a larger or long-term perspective rather than talking about all the things we're reading about six times or 60 times a day right now, right? I mean, right now we have a lot of contest of opinion. Uh, we're awash in data. Most of it's bad and incomplete data. Uh, even the uh, fatality count is uh, subject to some measure of doubt because of the way it's being classified, because of the perverse incentives for hospitals to be rewarded for classifying deaths as COVID-19 deaths, when they may only be one factor or a non-factor at all, who knows? Uh, also, uh, to the extent that we are using the old war metaphor, I mean, even President Trump has said we have a war on a virus. I think the corollary cliche we're all used to of the fog of war is the right metaphor for where we are. I will offer a couple of predictions uh, on some particular points of how this may wind up in the next six to 12 months to three to five years. Uh, but as I say, I wanna draw back and put this in a larger context that I think is more relevant to our general concern about individual liberty, democratic governance, free markets, uh, and so forth. Um, so there are two strands for us to try and grab hold of here. Um, the first is the problem, which we really see with this whole virus business, of what we call expert or scientific government. The cliche we hear is, listen to the experts, follow the experts. And never mind for a moment that experts disagree. Uh, there's something really startling to me, and I, I watched the evening news tonight before uh, uh, coming here. And there was Anthony Fauci once again up before Congress and the news media treating him as though he was the Oracle of Delphi and that he's the last word on, on all these subjects. And even he disclaimed that he's the last word, but not that the media uh, figured that out. And, and he's a very experienced man, very knowledgeable man. And of course he's worth listening to, uh, but you see that the, uh, the, the, way, uh, the way the media sets this up and the way it's represented by especially political partisans as well. You have to listen to this one man because he is the expert. Uh, and I'll come back to this point about expertise and the broader philosophy behind scientific administration uh, in a moment, because the second point I want to lay out setting out is what is known uh, among a lot of uh, political economists and economic historians as the ratchet effect, or you might say the crisis and Leviathan phenomenon. In other words, Every time we have a big crisis in our history, it's usually war, but it can be something like this. We end up at the back end of it with larger government, with a permanently larger government, often taxing higher and spending more and extending its permanent bureaucratic reach. Oh, it's, it's true that the government recedes a little bit from the um, uh, immediate emergency of a war or even a Great Depression, but there's still, it's like a tide that comes in higher every time, right? Uh, and I think there's a great danger that we're gonna see that with the current crisis over the virus. And I'll talk about some ways we may see that play out and may already see it play out with some of the moves of say the Federal Reserve and so forth. Um, but there may also be some reason this time for a measure of optimism. And I'll explain that in a minute. I wanna talk more about the second point first, what I call the ratchet effect. Um, I think the first thing you'd say about a permanently larger government is it doesn't always mean, in fact, usually does not mean a more competent government, right? And of course, uh, you never go wrong reminding ourselves of the old Ronald Reagan line, when government expands, liberty contracts, right? You, you, you can just end there and you're, you're gonna do fine. Uh, but think of some of the bigger examples just from the last hundred or so years. Uh, you think of World War I, and you know, we adopted the income tax the year before World War I started and three years before we entered the war. And remember it was said, well, the rate would never be above 10%. And once the war came and the government needed a vast revenue, suddenly we had 90% income tax rates. And those came back in the 30s, again in the 50s and World War II and so forth. And now of course, people on the left would like to bring back 90% income tax rates, if not actually some of them I think want a 100% income tax rate on some high threshold of income. Okay, uh, we've got a lot of economic planning and regulation out of World War I, a lot of bad inflation too. Uh, and a lot of people, especially when the depression came around said, well, look, we planned in war, why can't we plan in peace? Uh, and so the experience of World War I uh, gave us a lot of, uh, of bad examples of economic planning that people thought could be made to work. We also know that World War I involved some serious uh, infringements on civil liberties, 
free speech and so forth. The depression, I think everyone is quite familiar with. We got all kinds of new regulatory agencies. We distorted our constitution to allow for it. Um, and, but then you get into World War II and we, we got something brand new. Uh, because we expanded the income tax even more to reach a lot of middle class people and working class people who previously didn't pay much income tax at all, we started income tax withholding. That was supposed to be a temporary wartime measure. Because you know, if people actually have to write a big check for all of their income tax every year, uh, I think there'd be a lot more public sentiment against the income tax. But because it's withheld from you, it, you know, your, your tax money is intercepted before it ever even gets into your pocket, it works a lot more smoothly. And so we've kept withholding, right? Uh, uh, you know, withholding become a permanent feature, like rent control. I should have mentioned rent control from World War I. That's when rent control starts, temporary wartime measure. We still have it 100 years later. Uh, in all the worst places. Um, I will come back to the Great Society and the war on poverty in the Vietnam War in a moment, uh, but that's another example of uh, a big problem that the government made the government bigger. Uh, in our own lifetime, just in the last 20 years, I think we recognize things like 9-11, right? Out of 9-11, we got several things that I think we may wonder about. First of all, we got the gigantic Department of Homeland Security which bundled together all our intelligence agencies, which is surely a mistake, even from an intelligence point of view. We got the lovely TSA at the airport, uh, frisking grandmas, uh, and uh, hugely overstaffed and hugely wasteful in terms of resources. Uh, and then, of course, we got the Iraq War. Uh, even if you think there might have been some rationale for smacking somebody around the Middle East that was clearly badly managed uh, and was clearly a mistake, at about that same time, maybe a few months before, you had the dot-com crash, uh, which seemed to involve uh, not just Silicon Valley and certain internet companies that were high flyers, but you also had some banks, uh, some telecommunications companies like WorldCom who had cooked the books, some of the accounting uh, auditing firms like Arthur Anderson that uh, signed off on uh, bogus books. And what we got out of that, we got the Sarbanes-Oxley bill, which was supposed to fix all this. And I'm not clear if it actually did or not. I'm doubtful about it. I've kind of forgotten some of the details. But one thing you know is that uh, all of these reforms to supposed financial misbehavior seem to have had no effect just in the next decade when you had the housing crash in 2007 and 2008. By the way, some other time maybe it's worth talking about how the housing crash is much more a story of government failure than it is of market failure or bad behavior by the mortgage industry and Wall Street. That's what the media likes to run with, but there's a lot more to that, including mistakes of the Federal Reserve. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with those stories, and I won't go into detail now, but what do we get out of all that? Well, we got the Dodd-Frank uh, regulation of the banking sector, uh, which is really quite perverse in its effects in a lot of ways. Um, my witness for this is none other than um, uh, Jamie Dimon, the chairman of uh, uh, the CEO of uh, JP Morgan, who said, I love Sarbanes-Oxley. It builds a bigger moat around my bank. What do you mean by that? A big bank can put up with all the onerous regulations because they have lots of expensive lawyers in-house and on retainer, whereas a local bank in, I don't know, Odessa, Texas, finds it very difficult to, uh, uh, to conform to these regulations and to put up with them. And there's lots of data, it emerged already, and still a decade later we can see it, that small banks, mid-sized banks are losing ground to the big banks in terms of their overall share of banking. And lo and behold, who's in the middle of all the uh, sort of bailout and, and uh, rescue efforts pres presently? It's the big banks much more than the little banks. Uh, and so here's another example of government getting permanently bigger in perverse ways. Um, uh, and uh, as I say, I think we're, we have some great risks of that happening now. I'll hold with some of those are to go back to my point number one. And I may have, maybe I could do this in either order. And that's the, the premise of the idea of scientific government. I think the promise of this has never been better stated than by Franklin Roosevelt on the cusp of his election in 1932 when he says in a speech, and here's a quote, the sentence was, the age of enlightened administration has arrived. The age of enlightened administration has arrived. And he mentioned Woodrow Wilson, and he was drawing from the progressives who said, we now have modern science. Modern science can give us expert government. We don't need all this grubby, uh, 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 grubby politics and partisan argument. Ideology is over. Because, you know, science is perfectly objective. It can tell us what we ought to do and the best course we should take. So we should just follow the scientists. So 
The kind of cliches we hear now are not new. They're at least 100 years old and maybe even older in certain ways. Now, the problem with this is, um, <laughs> how do you want to put this? Uh, the experts sometimes aren't very expert, uh, right? Uh, they're often wrong. They often disagree. Uh, if you follow social science and even some uh, medical science, you'll know that there's a great crisis in replication these days. Uh, it's really kind of a scandal sometimes, the number of so-called scientific studies, very fancy regressions that can't be replicated for, whatever, for one reason or another. Uh, the other problem is, is that, uh, uh, once again, everyone uh, who promotes the idea of scientific administration, which, by the way, almost always involves centralized administration, We'll come back to that point in a minute, they would all benefit from reading Hayek, of course, because Hayek uh, explained more, uh, I think more importantly than anything else in his teaching, about the importance of decentralized knowledge, of localized knowledge. And if there was ever a problem for which the Hayekian approach to dealing with a problem, even on a national level, is called for, it's the current one now, right? We have different conditions, different kinds of populations, different kinds of health risks from the uh, coronavirus in different parts of the country. And yet we insist on having one size fits all policies directed initially from Washington, but then from our state governors, right? Um, if you're following what's going on in California, you'll know that tiny Modoc County has had, I think, no cases of the virus, would like to open up their barber shops and cafes. Only 8,000 people live in this great big county. It's not a tourist destination. And of course, Governor Newsom's answer is no. Uh, and that's completely preposterous, right? This is clearly a case of where you ought to let local people of, in, in any uh, regime that professes to believe in self-government, let's actually let have, let's have some self-government take place. Um, and by the way, decentralized knowledge leads to better outcomes. Um, the problem with centralized administration, whether you call it scientific or not, is that it does tend to lead to one size fits all answers to things. Um, and so you'll hear a lot of people say, well, gosh, South Korea seems to have done such a much better job of handling the virus than the United States has. And that's true in one very important respect. Uh, when we first saw the virus as a potential problem here back in, I don't know, January or February, the Centers for Disease Control uh, says, okay, we'll come up with a test. And if you know how this has gone, they totally botched it. Their initial test didn't work. And moreover, they said that, no, we won't let independent laboratories, university laboratories, pharmaceutical companies, nobody else can develop a test. We're going to do it ourselves because we're the CDC. South Korea, on the other hand, when they saw a problem coming their way, the first thing they did was say, universities, medical companies, researchers, knock yourself out trying to develop a test and let's see what you come up with. And they came up with tests much quicker and rolled them out much quicker. And here, because we had, again, the experts at the CDC saying, we're the authorities on this, and we want to centralize it because we can't cope with this chaotic world, uh, actually hindered our response uh, uh, to the virus, right? Um, another one is, is that uh, the promise of expert government is that it will be neutral. It won't be politicized. And I don't know why anybody can still believe this, but there are still true believers. I'm, I know a lot of friends of mine, uh, you know, smart lefties think, the current crisis shows we need, you know, why federalism is a mistake, uh, uh, why decentralization is a mistake, why we need to have much more expertise and authority and power in the central government. And, you know, they, I, you know, I don't know whether they're, you know, malevolent or, or really dumb, uh, because the idea that, uh, you know, the CDC is a perfect example. Why do they not want to allow independent laboratories and universities to develop tests? Well, it would diminish their power, wouldn't it, right? Uh, it would diminish their reason for being. Uh, the idea that uh, a bureaucratic uh, scientific or expert administration is not going to be self-interested is completely ridiculous. I mean, this is the central insight of public choice theory, of course, which is that uh, public agencies are just as self-interested as a for-profit company. Now, they don't have a profit and loss statement like you know, Microsoft or General Motors, but what they do have is a budget. And they do have their power and they do have their single-minded zealotry. You know, if you work especially at the EPA, your, your, your mandate is to protect the environment no matter what the cost, because you don't have to wear trade, uh, away trade-offs. Uh, and uh, so there you go. You, you have the worst of all worlds. You have defective expertise on Hayekian grounds and you have the self-interest of bureaucrats 
who are just as self-interested in accumulating power and sealing off political competition as elected politicians or party politicians do. Okay, that uh, brings me to a, a couple of more examples to mention from modern times. One is, is uh, yeah, experts, you know, listen to experts. Uh, there's a great book, actually, I've got a copy of it here. I'll just flash it up real quick. It's Philip Tetlock's book, Expert Political Judgment. He, he was at Berkeley for a long time, and now he's back in, um, I don't know, Tufts or somewhere on the East Coast. And he starts that book, uh, which is now 10 years old, with a very simple question. Why is it that none of the experts in the 1980s, before, or even late in the 80s, predicted the demise of the Soviet Union? And it's something I wrote about a lot in my Reagan book. If you go back and look at all the uh, advanced Sovietologists, you know, they even had a semi-scientific sounding name. They all said, and the CIA, by the way, uh, said the same thing. Oh, the Soviet Union's fine. Yeah, they got problems, but they're gonna be around a long time. And all the estimates from the CIA were wrong. All the judgments from our Sovietologists at universities were completely wrong. And the two or three people in the early to mid 1980s who said there may be real problems here, they might come apart, were all laughed at. And people at the State Department who'd say, maybe we want to plan for a post-Soviet world in another 20 years. People would look at, like, look at you like you were from the planet Mars. Those are the experts, right, who said that we should be listening to them on how we conduct our foreign policy. And we have the same kind of thing going on today, I think. And then you step back before that, uh, the Vietnam War was the first war that was going to be run according to scientific social science principles. And we know how that worked out. <laughs> I can talk a long time about that. Likewise, the same people, literally some of the same people, brought us the whole great society that they promised this was going to end poverty in America in 10 years. That promise was made in 1966 before some congressional committees. We'll wipe out all poverty in America in 10 years because we now have social science expertise as well as lots of money to throw at the problem. Uh, so those are some of my favorite examples of listening to the experts and giving them lots of money and we saw what happened with all that. Okay, finally, uh, I'll now get to what I think are the prospects of the current pro uh, crisis, some specific and general things. Uh, one is you can kind of guess already, um, you know, we may end up with a pandemic agency out of all this. I hope not. Um, I mean, we've got a you know, hodgepodge of things already. We've got the Department of Health and Human Services. We have the CDC. Uh, we have the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, we've got a few other lesser nodes of things. And then we've got the miserable World Health Organization. By the way, another example of an expert agency corrupted by politics, in their case, Chinese politics, of course. Um, uh, but I could see uh, the, Im uh, uh, the impulse in Congress to create a pandemic agency to plan for and plan against future pandemics like this one, notwithstanding that future ones may be very different. We may have a virus that, uh, like the Spanish flu of 1918, uh, actually uh, uh, found that younger people were more vulnerable to the Spanish flu than today. Today, it's more elderly people, right? We might find a virus or a bacteria here in a few years that uh, everybody's equally vulnerable to. And so the, you know, the kind of protocols we're adapting on the fly today would be wrong for all that. Um, second, it would involve, of course, an awful lot of spending, an awful lot of bureaucracy, uh, and I only mentioned it briefly, but the Department of Homeland Security is pretty dysfunctional. <laughs> I've known this from people I've talked to who've tried to work in the senior ranks there. Uh, it just doesn't work very well. Um, I think that um, we saw this 10, 11 years ago with the financial crisis and the housing crash, is we got suddenly used to spending trillion dollars really fast. Uh, in the case of Obama, well, first it was TARP, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, $800 billion approved in about 72 hours by Congress, uh, and then another trillion dollars in so-called stimulus spending. And now we're already $3 trillion into this. And just this morning, if you read the news, the House Democrats proposed another $3 trillion in spending right now. Uh, and I think we're going to get too used to the idea that we could just write lots of checks. In fact, there's been a theory building for a while on the left called modern monetary theory, which essentially means it's really a new name for Keynesianism. We can borrow and spend all we want because it's our own currency. And, you know, that's only true until it doesn't work, which eventually it wouldn't. But the fact that we have near zero interest rates and, uh, you know, no inflation right now uh, is uh, providing a lot of very bad lessons, I think, such that we can either get inflation in the future uh, or 
this idea that we can just spend all the money we want because, you know, what's the problem? Uh, you're going to see a lot of enthusiasm for instituting a universal basic income. I mean, we've already seen a, you know, a sample of this with the uh, stimulus checks being sent to people with the additional uh, unemployment insurance uh, amount that's been added on from the federal government. Uh, I think the, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, I, I mean, I think this whole thing is a disaster for environmentalists. I can come back to that perhaps, but the Green New Deal is going to get pushed. Well, gosh, you know, we can write checks for all these things. Why not write checks for solar panels everywhere? Um, another uh, prospect out of all this is, um, and this is something that's not brand new, you've been seeing this bubble up on the right for a while, is there's a lot of enthusiasm for what I call industrial policy of the right. It, it comes from a lot of the uh, sort of uh, people in the new sort of nationalist movement among conservatives, some of whom are my friends, some of their thoughts that I have some sympathy with, um, but um, I'm having a hard time telling apart uh, the ideas that people like Orrin Cass and other people, or even President Trump for that matter, have from what Walter Mondale was saying in the 1980s, that conservatives and libertarians everywhere said was clearly a bad idea. Now, it's one thing to say that being so dependent on China for so much of our supply chain is a strategic problem. Uh, and, you know, that's a reasonable point, uh, but I think we make a mistake when we confuse that with the economics of free trade and open markets. Um, and I think we want to keep those rigidly separate. We could talk more about all of that. Uh, say one last thing, I, you know, just think about here in California, for those of you who are here in California, especially Southern California, you'll remember that after the Northridge earthquake in 1994, which was a pretty severe one, and you know, a bunch of apartment buildings fell over, a bunch of commercial buildings fell over. And fortunately, the death toll was pretty low because it was at 6 a.m. or something like that, so people weren't out and about as much. Uh, but the state then passed regulations that certain kinds of buildings had to be reinforced to withstand much higher earthquake uh, uh, potential. And I actually owned a commercial building at the time that I had to spend a lot of money on to uh, retrofit for earthquake readiness. And, I think that probably makes sense, but that's expensive to do. Now think about uh, what kind of regulations our regulation happy state might uh, uh, impose uh, as a permanent matter because of a fear of pandemics. Um, I'll just mention one I can think of. Uh, you know, there's been some data about how uh, certain people in restaurants got, uh, had a high acquisition of the virus and it depended on where they were seated relative to the ventilation system in a restaurant. Well, that may be correct, probably is, uh, but I'm sitting here thinking, uh, you know, it's not gonna take long until some moron in Sacramento says, well, you know, we have to go through all the buildings in the state and retrofit their ventilation system. So they, I don't know, they suck air out or sort of negative ventilation or something. I think that's probably an idiotic idea. It'd be hugely expensive, but don't be surprised if uh, uh, to see something like that uh, especially in the crazier states like California, Oregon, Colorado, Illinois, etc. cetera. Um, now, <clears throat> I did say that maybe, <laughs> having said all these things, that maybe there's a cause for some optimism. Uh, for a long time, I and others have been thinking about, would we ever have a crisis that actually reversed the ratchet effect, where we actually came out of it or you know, dealt with it in the middle or came out of it saying, gosh, Maybe what we should do is have smaller government, have delegate, decentralized government, a return to federalism. And here and there, you do see some aspects of this going on. I mean, you see people protesting to want to reopen their economies. You see certain governors resisting uh, the cookie cutter approach like uh, uh, Christine Noem in North Dakota and Governor Kemp in Georgia reopening, uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida uh, charting his own course, Texas reopening earlier. Um, and there are a couple other things you've seen done. So the Trump administration uh, has, uh, I mean, they're uneven like every government in the world has been. But the Trump administration has said, all right, we're going to waive a whole lot of process requirements on approving new drugs, developing vaccines, developing tests and rolling them out. And normally they're waiving regulations that would uh, uh, usually impose a year long process for something. So you might want to raise the question, why, why should we bring any of those back? Why not just get rid of them forever? I mean, the story of, of the FDA's needless delays in approving new drugs is very well known in the people in the field. Uh, and so now is an opportunity to maybe rip some of these out of the roots and get rid of them. 
I'll give you one other specific example that I've uh, noticed. Uh, it's a really tiny one, but it, it's, it, it, it gets at the kind of uh, way we should think about this. So as everyone knows, um, you know, right now the, truck or the trucking industry is one of the essential industries in the country. They're working overtime to haul toilet paper around to all the places that have overbought it and so forth. Uh, we have waived some of the regulations on the number of hours truckers can drive because those have been very strict for a long time. Another little one caught my eye. Um, for a long time, most states have had a ban on any food trucks operating in rest stops on interstate highways. You know, if you pull into a rest stop in California and most other Western states, they're pretty dismal affairs. If they have any food at all, they're in vending machines. So it's Snickers bars and Cokes and stuff like that. Well, why can't a food truck operate in a, a rest stop? Well, it's been prohibited by law. And why is that law there? Well, it's because the truck stops, which usually operate restaurants, have lob and the, you know, the truck stops are part of the, you know, the great organized lobby like restaurants are, and they've always lobbied to prohibit food trucks from operating in rest stops where they would be competition. Well, because so many truck stops are shut down, at least their restaurants are, not the fuel part, a lot of states have waived those regulations prohibiting food trucks from operating in rest stops. Well, why don't we just leave it that way, is my point. Um, you, you know, you, you can have a, a, a reservation system or a permit system like you do for campgrounds, so you're not overrun with food trucks, but why not open up that market? Uh, and uh, so little things like that uh, have sort of happening out of necessity right now. And I think a clever person would say, you know, let's, um, uh, let's do more of that, please. Uh, and the Trump administration, you know, one of the things they did when they came into office is they adopted a Canadian proposal, oddly enough, which says that every agency has to repeal two existing regulations for every one regu new regulation they bring into place. So I don't know, maybe we got up that ratio to get rid of three for every one. Um, another one I think it'll be fun to propose, uh, it'd be tough to get through Congress, but it would be a sunset provision, which is every regulation, and you'd have to tailor this in a certain way to, so it made some sense, but, uh, or had certain thresholds, but uh, every regulation sunsets every, I don't know, 20 years. And at that point, Congress has to reauthorize it by majority vote. So you make members of Congress go on the record uh, and then they'd be subject to the kind of pressures from uh, you know, the costs and benefits from both sides. Uh, uh, and some regulations are clearly obsolete and ought to go by the boards, but they go on forever because the bureaucracies don't want to get rid of them. So they may have fun way to exploit this and say, let's, uh, let's clean house now. Um, there are other proposals like that uh, around for prospective regulation, but I think we ought to do it retroactively too. Um, so, <coughs> Those, I, I'll sort of end very abruptly here. Those are some of my uh, few opening thoughts on the matter. And I give just a couple little thoughts here at the end on, you know, maybe not all, all hope is lost. Uh, but with that, I will stop and we can start having uh, questions and comments and whatever. Our first question deals with the quarantining. And uh, I think everyone would understand and think it's legal that quarantining uh, the people who are ill makes sense. But this is unusual. There has there been a precedent, precedent for forcibly isolating the well, and is this mass restriction of the liberty of healthy citizens constitutional? As a for sort of public health. Yeah, that's a that's a tough question. Um, I mean, there's uh, uh, two parts of that you can look at. One is, you know, you can look at some Supreme Court precedents. You go all the way back to 1905 when the Supreme Court upheld mandatory vaccination. I mean, that's a you know, subject that has been newly controversial, vaccinations in general, but also compulsory vaccination. Nowhere more so than, say, Marin County. <laughs> um, odd how that happens. Anyway, um, and then it gets back to what we call the police power. Uh, the police power is the government's implied power. I say implied, it's not stated in the Constitution anywhere, but it's always thought to have been implied that the government has the power to protect the health and safety we used to say morals, but not anymore, of the people. And that power has always been construed very broadly, always thought to reside on the state level. The Supreme Court said, I think as early as the 1820s, that there's a broad police power, but it rests at the state level. Again, that's not stated anywhere in the Constitution. Uh, so that, it's hard to draw the lines there. Uh, however, point number two is, as a practical matter, 
And one of the things that I like is, uh, you know, people are just engaging in more and more civil disobedience, right? This is already breaking down. I mean, the announcement today was that Los Angeles County is thinking of extending its lockdown for three more months. I saw that, you know. That is not going to happen. I mean, you know, we already saw the fight over the beaches uh, in Orange County and elsewhere. And I think increasingly what's going to happen is people are just going to say no. Now, the one big question is, one thing if people want to get out and about and go to the beach and go play tennis and go to the park, maybe have parties and the police are not going to want to be busting up parties. But what about uh, like uh, there was a restaurant that opened, where was that? Was that here in California? I'm trying to remember. There was a restaurant that opened for business and was crowded with people like old times and it had their license pulled. I think that maybe was Colorado is what I saw. Uh, and so there's the problem is whether there's the civil disobedience is going to extend to commercial enterprise. Uh, there are some lawsuits about all this that uh, I hope will, say the burden on the government to justify the extent of this kind of lockdown uh, ought to be a lot higher and a lot harder for the government to satisfy. Because by the way, I didn't, I didn't say this earlier. I, I think my hunch about this is we're going to be examining this whole period very closely for many years to come. There are going to be lots and lots of studies. I think there are going to be very many of them that said we've gone about this all wrong. Uh, and, uh, but there'll be, you know, multiple regression analysis, they'll be contested by other studies, and it'll be confusing for the lay person to follow. Um, but I, I think uh, that the weight of evidence is going to be that this has been a huge mistake how we've gone about this. We've gone about it way too broadly. And that will hopefully uh, add to the argument that the government next time, if there is a next time, if they try to do something like this again, it better be a lot more solid than what we've had now. Thanks, sir. Now we'll jump over to uh, economics and the things that, a very good question uh, that the economy was really riding high before this happened. Would things be much worse now had that not happened? Or it was, is it worse to have a big fall or is it worse that if we're just an incremental change or who would, how to, who knows? Yeah, you know, no one knows. I mean, that the, um, we've never had anything like this before where you, you didn't have a financial crash or financial panic or, uh, you know, some exot, as economists say, some exogenous shock like the oil price, oil embargoes of the 70s, or the chronic inflation of the, of the late 70s, and early 80s, uh, or, you know, a war coming along. This is self-induced. Um, and, you know, there's some reason to suppose, you have all these people wanting to go back to work like Elon Musk at, at Tesla today. Um, and so there's some reason to be optimistic that things will boom fast. When you have something this bad, this sharp, this fast, often you usually get a quick and sharp rebound. Now, on the other hand, the longer this drags on, the more and more companies are not coming back at all. Uh, I think today the Steak and Shake chain announced they're going to close permanently 57 locations. Uh, the Soup Plantation the restaurant chain has said they're done because they have a buffet style that they think no one will uh, come to. Um, you know, airlines are going to shrink a lot. They're not coming back for several years. And so it's looking to me like day by day, it's one thing if we did this for two weeks or even one month, but now that we're two months into this with another month to go, it looks like at least, um, it, it looks to me like we're now accumulating some really serious uh, damage. That's just my guess about things. Uh, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope there is a, a fast it's rebound. It's interesting that you mentioned Elon Musk. We had one question on that specifically, and just my own personal bias, I really enjoyed this. I've I've been sort of anti-Tesla, not so much of the cars, but I find that their drivers are really pompous, but that's just my own bias. But I have to say, I'd always want to buy one just because of Elon Musk's reaction. I'm, I'm, I'm going back, and if you're going to arrest anyone, it's me. Was there retribution? That was actually a question, or was there, he, it's a, and it's kind of silly. I, again, another personal feeling is that especially the local people in charge, they want to sort of one up them. And so the thought was, well, you can't go back on Monday. You can't go back for another five days. Really? Yeah. Is that, you know, is that such a big difference? But I, have you heard, was there retribution or they just left him alone? Uh, I haven't heard. He, he may be too big to take on. Uh, so first of all, just uh, three, three or four things about it. Um, you know, if, if Tesla didn't lobby for and depend so heavily on subsidies, I think we don't like that guy for the most part. I mean, I know he's a little crazy yeah. and he, smokes pot on camera and he tweets crazy stuff. But uh, look, I mean, one thing to say about Musk is unlike a lot of people in Silicon Valley, he's actually building a, you know, a, a concrete product. You know, it was something with steel and, you know, 
Um, and I think there's some problems with the technology, but he's really trying to make something there. And his, and his rocket thing is kind of fun. So I think we, you know, he's proving himself right now to be kind of a Randian hero in some respects. Say, no, no, I'm going to open up. Now, um, uh, two things happen today, and then I'll give you a, a, a way to why we might all want to buy Pri a, a Tesla. Sorry, not Priuses. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, Tesla, I, sorry, Musk has done the great thing by saying, maybe I'm just going to move out of California. Now, you know, uh, apparently at some point today, Governor Newsom said, well, really, this is a dispute between Musk and Tesla in Alameda County. And I thought that was Governor Newsom blinking. I thought that was yeah. very significant. Yeah. Uh, and if I'm Alameda County, I think I'd want to hesitate for a moment and say, do I want to lose X millions of dollars a year in tax revenue if uh, Tesla ups and leaves the state? I doubt they do. Uh, and so I mean, you know, it, it is an expensive proposition for him to move out of state, but he's already got his battery facility in Nevada. So maybe he would, wouldn't surprise me. And I, I think, uh, it's fun to watch all that. Um, two things quick about a Tesla. One is, is that, um, you know, they're really not very green. <laughs> um, I think the calculation, a serious calculation I've heard from an MIT engineer I know is that, uh, the raw materials to make a battery for a Tesla you know, it's a great big heavy thing that goes where your trunk goes. I, I think the raw materials, in other words, the volume of, of things you dig out of the ground is about 400,000 pounds for each battery. Of course, you end up with something that's 1,000 pounds, but you know, what you actually have to dig out of the earth, refine, mold, manufacture, ship, etc. it's an enormous a, a, a resource, a, a very resource intensive, more so than the oil you would burn in a ordinary car. Second thing is, if you drive a Tesla in Ohio or Indiana, where you're plugging it into a grid that is 90% supplied by coal, you're driving a coal-powered car. Uh, and so I do have a friend who lives back east, uh, and he has a Tesla. He's a very wealthy guy. That's like his fourth car. And he had a bumper sticker made that said, how do you like my uh, coal-powered car? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I see all these, uh, I see all these Teslas on the road that say, oh, my, you know, my emission free car. And I go, no, it's not. Even here in California, half the electricity is from natural gas. And that's lower than coal, but it still produces uh, air pollution. Um, so that's why, you know, if we all uh, felt like it, it would be fun to all go out and buy Teslas, uh, put NRA stickers on them, and then also put the stickers on, how do you like my uh, fossil fuel powered car? That's right. That's a good thing to do. Okay, getting back to the, the pandemic, and you mentioned um, the, it was the Department of uh, Pandemics said, dear God, please no, thus we don't need that. But uh, along those lines, maybe some planning is necessary. Do, do you think there is something that does give the department or what might be a better way to, to look into Now that we will have had some experiences like the countries in Asia had and we didn't. So I think we they got the benefit of that. Just a couple, three things that maybe we can do for either the revival of this one or the next one? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not an expert in public health, but a few things occurred to me. One is, one reason why Japan and South Korea uh, did relatively better is they're very high density populations. They have more experience, plus they've been closer to China, which has sprung, well, this is the third bug out of China in the last 20 years that's been regarded as serious, but it's the first one that really took root here. Uh, and so, you know, they respond quicker. They're also smaller countries, not only in population, but geography. So easier for them to deal with it than, uh, than for our big sprawling country. Um, having said that, um, yeah, you probably do want to stockpile certain kinds of supplies, the way we stockpile munitions for defense. Um, the, you know, the way we, I don't know, we have stockpiles of lots of things, I think. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know the true story here. There's lots of allegations that we ran down our stockpiles in the flu epidemic of 2009 or 2010 and didn't replenish it. I don't know if that's true or not. I think we'll find out. There'll, there'll be some commission at the end of all this that will investigate it and produce a report that will be a mixed bag. Um, uh, so, and then, um, I don't know. Um, we keep trying to centralize healthcare generally, whether it's through Obamacare or something else. And I think that just makes a mess of things. Uh, I think it would be a good idea for, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not a fan of, of federal mandates on the states, but you might want to say, you know, states come up with your plan. What do you think you need in the future? Something like that might be worth thinking about. Yeah, sounds, sounds like a good idea. Hey, uh, uh, 
really coming a lot here. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent as well, but what do you think about the Democrats asking U.S. taxpayers to bail out their unsustainable, unfunded state pension liabilities? That was the, and you only have three minutes, Steve. So right. I can do that in three seconds. No, no, and no. Um, oh yeah, they, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I say that there's, not everything's bad news. Um, I love the fact that a lot of universities are gonna to have to face the dilemma of laying off uh, useless professors and useless administrators uh, or going out of business. This is a good thing. You're seeing some signs of that already. Uh, and then second, I think this is gonna uh, provoke a final crisis for com completely ill-governed states like Illinois and Connecticut and also California. Uh, and yeah, I mean, the, the problem here is if uh, the Democrats sweep the elections in November, which is possible, uh, then I think a bailout for the states is in the future. Uh, I don't exclude the possibility that Trump would embrace, uh, would embrace some amount of bailout only because there will be some Republican governors who are going to want to uh, see some federal assistance because uh, even relatively better run red states are also in big trouble um, uh, uh, financially. And so I, it may turn out to be irresistible, but boy, I hope we resist it as much as possible. And the, jumping back to the economy, uh, certainly in the last few weeks and months, there's a different thought about um, free trade with China or, or tariffs with China. And now that China has such a deservedly, to my mind, bad reputation for all these kind of behavior they did. Um, do you have any comments on maybe how the U.S. and, and ex-U.S., how other countries would see trade with China, working with China, maybe, I know Japan is trying to get a lot of their pharmaceuticals back. Apparently they had done stuff with China and they, they see the value of that. Uh, is there justice in the end? Is there a price that China pays? That's a good question. I, I was asking somebody today, it was uh, uh, Charles Lipson at the University of Chicago, who's an international relations guru. And the question I asked him was, is China too big to fail? I mean, a variation of the bank problem. I mean, they become so big and so embedded in the supply chain and also a fairly substantial customer for a lot of American agriculture, for example. Uh, it's hard to see just pulling the plug on that directly. Um, and, and by the way, China will require that, you know, look, Apple, if you want to sell iPhones in China, you've got to make them here or make some of them here. I think Apple said in the last 48 hours, they're going to investigate building more of their iPhones and other products in India. So that's one thing I think ought to be done is, you know, maybe, manu and I think, I don't know that the government necessarily has to tell manufacturers this. I think an awful lot of people in the business world are tired of having their IP ripped off by China. They're tired of uh, dealing with them in a lot of ways. And so, you know, big opportunity here for India, Vietnam, other countries that don't have much love for China uh, to grab some business away from them. Um, <clears throat> so I hope that some of that happens. Um, but I don't know, that's a, that's a tough one. There's a broader problem here, I'll just say this about this very briefly. Um, we thought, uh, there's two strands of it. One is we thought if we admit China to the World Trade Organization, what, 20 years ago now, they'll start playing by the rules, uh -huh. uh, it'll be beneficial for everybody, and you know, we all like cheap stuff from China. On the other hand, they didn't play by the rules, right? They're, they're very predatory and, uh, and, you know, and outright steal things, okay. Um, Second one is more troubling, and that is that, you know, people like Milton Friedman, I knew Milton pretty well, and not just Milton Friedman, uh, always said it, we always thought this made sense, that where you have economic liberalization, political liberalization will soon follow. That's been true throughout a lot of history, and so there was lots of optimism that when China began to open up in the early 1980s, uh, and I think, you know, they're not really true Marxist-Leninists there. I mean, they have a communist party, but it's more, you know, they don't have anything better. Um, uh, but they're still very authoritarian, uh, very dictatorial, and uh, we have not seen any serious political liberalization, quite the opposite. I, I think a lot of people think the Chinese took the example of the Soviet Union and said, that's not going to happen to us. We want economic liberalization, but we don't want any of that political liberalization stuff. Um, and so that's a problem, because I think that until you get some kind of political liberalization, uh, you're not, they're not going to behave very well economically. Um, and so here's the problem. That theory, uh, which, you know, I kind of still believe in a lot of ways, and I think it, it works in a lot of places, um, it, it, there's a big challenge to that idea posed by China. And because there's such a big country and such a big economy, economy it's a big challenge. 
gosh, and that's there. I actually just popped up that it's a good piggyback to that. And maybe this is too complex to just answer right on the fly. But if there was authentic free trade between the U.S. and China, what would that look like? Ah, good question. Um, it would probably look pretty good, I think. Um, yeah, that, that is it's an interesting thing to think about that I, yeah. I, I don't know what it would really do. Maybe we should like uh, go back as an interest. Another um, one of our viewers wants to ask going to the law enforcement and free will and and this gentleman was disappointed not to see that there was more discretion on the part of law enforcement to not come down with a heavy hand. I think this might be very localized, but any thoughts of, you know, what police should and shouldn't do? Well, um, hmm. <laughs> of course, you know, uh, there's that great poster, which I'm sure a lot of people have seen that shows, you know, especially young people protesting, they want more government. And on the other side of the screen is the police shooting pepper spray at them and the sign over them is more government. Remember, police are the leading edge of government. I like to say that the police are just bureaucrats in uniform, which is really true in the big cities. Um, mm. Now, so that's a problem. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm among those, uh, I count myself among those libertarians who think we ought not to be reflectively defenders of the police uh, as a default position. Uh, and by the way, just think about that. It's too long a talk. I give talks to students about how do police talk? They talk like bureaucrats. They didn't used to. 50 years ago when it was, you know, Sergeant Murphy on the beat. And now they do, they talk like bureaucrats. Uh, and, and because police work has been bureaucratized for good and bad reasons. However, uh, I, again, there's a big spectrum of behavior here. You have seen some sheriffs in Michigan saying, no, Governor Whitmer, we're not gonna enforce these ridiculous lockdown orders. Uh, I think you've seen a lot of police that have just used common sense like police ought to use. Mm -hmm. uh, I've attended a couple of protests down here in the San Luis Obispo County on the Central Coast. People aren't really practicing social distancing much. Doesn't scare me. It's on the bright sunshine. The risk is extremely low if you follow these things. Uh, and the police are there to observe from a distance. They don't trouble it. I, you know, uh, I think uh, you know, where police and sheriffs have some common sense, uh, you can't make these things stick. Uh, and you've seen other places where they don't have common sense. You know, what they, I don't know if it was sheriffs or Malibu police or whoever it was arrested some guy by himself out surfing by the Malibu pier a couple weeks ago. And, you know, that's just absurd, right? Uh, oh, so, no, sorry, you can't catch that wave. Go to Walmart instead. You know, how does this make any sense at all? Right, right. And this is just anecdotal, but I want to share it. Sometimes it's the opposite approach where I can't remember where I heard this, but there were some people out at at a park and they were all apart from each other and they saw a patrol car going around and they kind of, oh my God, I get hassled. And the policeman drove up with them specifically to say, no, I just wanted to tell you everything's okay. Yes, and I right. thought, well, isn't that great? So it's, it's nice that it goes in both directions. Well, here's one, Steve, that's gonna to talk to your, uh, I like this question, it comes to your original topic. If we allow the government to shut down our economy out of fear this time for health, what's to stop a future government to shut us down sometime because climate scientists are expert and they would like, you know, they think the world's gonna end. So that's a... Yeah, so um, think back to you know, the beginning of the democratic debates last summer, I guess. And I think you had at least two candidates, Jay Inslee, the governor of Washington. I'm not sure if somebody else, but Jay Inslee said on day one as president, I would declare climate change to be a national emergency. I and mean, use the president's power under national emergency to mobilize the country to fight this you know, urgent crisis. Okay, well, what does that mean? It might, and by the way, you see all these environmentalists right now saying, gosh, the air is so clean and the water is clear. It isn't this great. And, uh, you know, I, 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 part of me wants them to keep talking like this because <laughs> it's completely insane, right? Um, uh, but, and so, you know, you can point out that, yeah, in fact, what we're going through right now is, in fact, a, uh, uh, you know, uh, how, how do you like your free trial uh, of socialism, right? Your free 90-day trial of socialism. You enjoying this if you're out of a job and worried about your future and so forth? Uh, uh, and, and, but by the way, just if you want to go by the data, um, you know, the, uh, the idea of the air is actually clear is kind of bogus. It's because of the time of year and a few other things. This is really not true. Um, but you know, it gets hold of the, it takes hold in the media and you can't shake it. But if you actually look at the data, you know, total emissions are not down all that much. Uh, not anywhere near what the climatistas, as I call them, say we have to reduce emissions by. And so 
if you really want to do uh, uh, achieve your climate goals by uh, you know, suppressing the economy, and some of them do want to do that, you take our current situation and you multiply it at least by a factor of three. And at that point, I think environmentalists, forget the police breaking up a group out in the park, the police will be helping you hunt down the environmentalists who impose this on us, right? This is not gonna happen. Um, that doesn't mean they won't try. It doesn't mean they won't, you know, uh, and might not succeed in spending a trillion dollars to put solar panels on every building in the country or something uh, equally stupid. Um, uh, but uh, I, I, that's why I said in my opening remarks that I think, could be wrong, but I think this current episode is a disaster for environmentalists uh, uh, over the long haul. I hope, hope that's true. Yeah. Well, we're going to stick our toe into politics because uh, that would be unavoidable. Those of us on the right feel a little bit paranoid that, hmm, maybe, maybe just maybe the left would like the economy to falter because it would look so bad in November for the Trump re-election. Maybe a few comments about that. Are we overly paranoid or just correctly paranoid? No, I think quite correctly paranoid. Um, I, 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 you know, well, again, we've never seen a situation like this before. Uh, normally, if you have a bad economy and you're the incumbent, you, it's, it's, it happened on your watch, it's your fault. I think people understand that the, what's happened right now is not the fault of bad economic policy. It's from something that just came out of nowhere, you know, a black swan event. And so the, uh, just to do sort of rank punditry, as my pal Jonah Goldberg likes to say, if you're trying to handicap Trump's chances, um, it's going to depend on whether people think he responded poorly or responded as well as anyone could have. In other words, whether he's blamed for all, the, all that we went through. Now, it's quite possible. I mean, look, Franklin Roosevelt got reelected twice in tough conditions. Uh, it's quite possible the opposite will happen. That people will say, well, you know, um, it, is, it wasn't his fault. He did the best he could. Uh, it was sort of tough, but the country rallied together. I don't know. Those kinds of things may come into play, along with the fact that uh, there'll be other issues involved, including the, you know, the obvious decrepitude of Joe Biden. It's impossible I, to ignore that, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, again, it, um, I'll just, this is a little bit off the main thread of the question, but Democrats have always done well in the past for, you know, 60 years now, when they had a younger candidate who represented a new generation, forward-looking, so it's John F. Kennedy, even Jimmy Carter to some extent. You leave out LBJ because he's a fluke of being vice president, uh, and especially Bill Clinton and Al Gore, right? They're, they were these two young guys from the South. They even called themselves new Democrats. There was sort of a freshness to them and a, you know, a generational overturning to them. Remember, those guys were nominated after Joe Biden had already lost a run for president, for God's sake, right? And, and Barack Obama, the same thing. He's a young guy, and the fact he's the first black president, he's all hip, and, you know. And so now we've got this guy who seems like a fossil from the Smithsonian Museum and who doesn't seem to be terribly forward-looking at all in any way. And, you know, just, just something about the cycles of history, the precedents make me think that I don't care what the – actually, the polls are tightening in the last 10 days or so. Uh, uh, I just, I just don't see at the end of the day how he makes it over the finish line um, it, with, with that, uh, with that, with those defects to him. But I don't know. I could be wrong. This is back to a, a legal question. Would responsible states, I mean, not the ones we just mentioned, and the one we're in, have standing to sue the federal government if the federal, if there's a bailout of the uh, states like California and Illinois and Connecticut? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, in a rightly ordered world, um, I, I think there would be a good case for indemnification. In other words, you know, you're a restaurant, you're a business, and the government says you have to close. And you say, fine, you owe me. That's a taking of my property, or that's, you know, a due process deprivation of my right to earn a living. And, of course, we don't live in that rightly ordered world. Those kind of claims against the government are why we have such, ex the, the, the fact that we can't make those kinds of claims in court and succeed in court is one reason why the government can regulate anything it wants these days in the area of commerce. Um, and so, you know, to the extent that the pay tech protection program and some of the other things uh, are kind of like that a little bit, I mean, you know, there, there's all kinds of defects to them as there is with any big program you rush through. A lot of people who deserve help aren't getting it. A lot of people who don't deserve help are getting it, right? Um, and now, as for the states, that's an interesting question too. Um, 
And I'm tempted to sort of default to a technical answer, which is there's so many areas of state spending that are paired with matching federal funds. And I could actually see a state possibly succeeding in a claim in court saying, uh, you, you've made uh, one of our spending programs insolvent by shutting down our access to tax. I don't know. You know, it's possible state might be able to bring a claim that would get pretty far in court, but I don't know. Um, you'd have to ask some really skilled lawyers about federalism issues about that. Right. If you had a magic wand, let's say, what are your solutions to reopening businesses in California? <sighs> Fast, you know, low, mask, six feet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think what I do. So, you know, part of, what's, uh, part of what's going on is, you know, you do see some people who behave recklessly, but a lot of those people are mad about being treated like children. Mm-hmm. I think that's very clear. And by the way, the New York Times, of all people, the New York Times had an article about this, oh, three weeks ago or so, uh, where they quoted a bunch of people saying, look, we're willing to go along with a lot of restrictions, but we don't want to be treated by, like children by our government. And so my inclination would be, well, Sweden, I, I think you emulate the Swedish model, which don't lock down everything. Uh, you close down large gatherings, uh, you advise people to keep social distance, uh, but then trust people to be responsible. And if they're not gonna be responsible, the hospitals are not overwhelmed. I, I don't, you know, I, I should say, I am convinced that the trade-offs of the uh, economic cost of this is going to be more damaging to the health of the people in other areas than the virus. I think we're already past that point on the curve. Uh, I think we're gonna learn that retrospectively. Uh, And that's another reason why this makes no sense to do it the way we've done it. Um, And, you know, so look, I think what you say is, uh, here's where we wanna spend our money. We wanna spend our money protecting elderly people, whether they're living in nursing homes, whether they're living by themselves. And you don't wanna get, you don't want them going to the store. You don't want them going out. We will bring, have people bring them groceries. You know, build a support, a robust support structure for the most vulnerable people. Um, <clears throat> that would be a lot more cost effective than what we're doing. Uh, and then, by the way, the rest of the population builds up herd immunity, as they've apparently done in Sweden. And uh, so that, that's, so, you know, my, right now I'm for the Big Bang, but along with, uh, and the problem is people like Newsom and all these other governors, they've kind of shot their credibility in all this. Um, I think if they'd said a month ago or two months ago, uh, Look, it isn't realistic to shut down the country for two months, but there are lots of risks here. And, and then just every day, just remind people, I think most people would behave responsibly because we're not, you know, we're not horrible people. For a specific question, uh, there was uh, some activity about the stimulus check. So you, should there be more of them? Whether it was a good idea, a bad idea? <sighs> I think they were, uh, I don't know. Uh, one thing I'm sure is a bad idea was adding $600 to unemployment checks uh, on top of what I, I think, you know, the weekly benefit in California is I, I think in most states it's roughly $300. So now you're getting $900 a week. And it's quite clear from the data. Well, well we've known from past recessions that when you extend the unemployment benefit period, it delays people getting back into the workforce. And right now there's lots of evidence and some data already accumulating of some businesses trying to reopen or ones that have gotten the uh, paycheck protection money. And a lot of workers are saying, wait a minute, I'm making more now in unemployment than I was when I was getting a paycheck and paying taxes. Uh, So I think that was a big mistake to juice the unemployment benefits. I think it would have been, we didn't have time, right? They they rushed this thing through. And and so we did two things. We said, you will do the paycheck protection thing and give money, uh, forgivable loans to businesses if they'll keep all their employees. And then for other people who weren't part of that, we're gonna, you know, make, uh, uh, living on unemployment <laughs> better than having a job. Uh, so that's going to be a big problem. The stimulus checks, I don't know. I, that seemed to me entirely unnecessary. I mean, I don't know if it's unnecessary or not. I have to think about that for a while. But um, uh, I think if you're doing unemployment insurance and paycheck protection, and there are other ways we might have done that, then that's probably enough. And I, I agree that the last thing you want to do is uh, incentivize people the wrong way. And I think yeah. that, was, that was different from just getting the stimulus. Something we heard a lot during Hurricane uh, Katrina was FEMA and how horrible it was. <laughs> do you feel it's been pretty good now? Or you don't, I don't hear about them, which makes me think that they're, they're doing okay. Yeah, if you're not hearing about them, they're probably doing fine. Uh, of course, the whole Katrina business was a, a bum rap on the Bush administration. Um, 
FEMA is not meant to uh, be on the ground in a place that's been wiped out by a storm for about 72 hours. That's their timeline. Uh, the Bush people didn't help themselves with their clumsy rhetoric and so forth. Um, but once again, you know who was there right away? <laughs> Walmart. Uh, you know, Walmart has their own meteorology division. They actually track the weather, and, and, and part of it is, you know, if you know there's going to be a big snowstorm in Nashville or an ice storm in Georgia or whatever, uh, you know, they plug it into their computers, and they know to load their supply trucks with more of this and less of that. Uh, and so, you know, they saw the hurricane coming, and they said, oh, okay, let's preposition some. So Walmart was actually in New Orleans before FEMA was. Uh, with, you know, as, you know, so rescue by the private sector. So once again, we see that, you know, the nimbleness of competition in the private sector uh, will always outdo what the government will do. Right, right. The next question is sort of interesting. It comes, it's based, I think, on culture. Do you see a change in personal behavior in California? Shaking hands, hugging, we're kind of a huggy society. Um, <laughs> I have really thought about that, but yeah, is there, do you see any changes in this day to day? Yeah, you know, I haven't thought about that too much, but that it almost fills me with hope. The idea that, you know, hot tubs might go out of fashion, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, all the group grope uh, huggy stuff that people in California have always done. I think I'm going to try and start the rumor on the internet that crystals, uh, uh, you know, tra crystals and new age, uh, uh, you know, new age spirituality spread viruses just to, you know, mess with people's heads. Uh, right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I. <sighs> What Dr. Fauci said, you know, handshakes may be a thing of the past. I certainly hope not. Um, and I do think, I mean, one thing that will linger that won't be bad is I do think people will be more conscious about hygiene and washing their hands and, mm -hmm. you know, not just, you know, covering up their mouth when they sneeze. And so things like that, that's fine. Uh, that'll be a nice improvement, I think. And, and we may actually have lower uh, flu uh, cycles the next few years, I think. Um, uh, but I think... I think, and I actually hope we go back to hugging and shaking hands. Yeah, I hate to give that up. That one, I don't want to want to do that again. Okay, well, uh, just a couple more here, and thanks so much. I loved all the lively discussions. Um, and something else you've heard is executive power: too much, too little. What's the right hand? Uh, mm -hmm. Are states should they be more involved, less involved? One size doesn't fit all. Maybe a couple words on executive power abuse or good use of it. Well, yeah, we have too much of it, of course. And um, one of the things that I was kind of hopeful about the reaction against Trump was that it might leave, lead, in the, on the federal level anyway, it might lead uh, Congress to assert itself more as I think it should uh, and trim the power of the executive branch. I mean, uh, you know, the, uh, and I've been disappointed in all that. So remember, Trump invoked the National Emergencies Act which, by the way, most of us have never heard of. It's been around since 1976 and gives the president lots of broad power to declare an emergency for any purpose, just about, and move money around from just about any place he wants to. Uh, and I thought maybe Congress ought to revisit that act and, and, if not repeal it, at least amend it with much more specific control on what qualifies as an emergency and so forth. Instead, what you heard Democrats do in their outrage about uh, using the National Emergencies Act to build the wall was, well, just wait till we get the White House again and you'll see what we do with it, like the climate change business I mentioned, right? So uh, now, <laughs> sometimes I wonder if Trump is, uh, 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 you know, uh, a clever genius about things. Um, uh, because on the one hand, he, he, you know, he's always inconsistent, of course. Uh, but his inconsistency sometimes has interesting and salutary effects. And in this case, you had governors saying, wait a minute, the government can't, the federal government can't tell us what to do. We're going to decide here in our states. And you've seen Democratic governors <laughs> saying this, right? I'm, I'm, I'm watching this with great amusement, watching uh, a, a Trump prompt Democrats into standing up for federalism. <laughs> it's, it's That's pretty, amazing. And I don't, you know, again, I think this may be accidental, but it's one of those odd things that happens. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, like so I was just going to say, it, it, part of the whole problem of the, the ratchet effect is that it has, it has been one of the things that has aggrandized executive power for a century now. This is not recent. This goes back at least a century. Uh, and um, as I say, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe this will be the end of the road for that, or at least the end of a couple of the byways, at least. It's fun how we all kind of reassociate as, an old, as a baby boomer myself. I was shocked about how many people on the 
the left don't like Russia all of a sudden. That's I just wasn't used to that for a long time. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. Welcome to the party. So that yeah. Was, uh, well, with that, thank you so much, Steve. This has been delightful.